from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Peggy Pearlstein, head of the Hebraic section here in the African Middle Eastern Division of the Library of Congress. Welcome to today's program, where we will have Merrill Leffler read from his new book of poetry, Mark the Music. I've actually never had an audience that just by itself quieted down. <laughs> this is wonderful. So Merrill, as many of you know, has had quite an interesting career. He came to the Washington area with a physics degree in the 1960s and worked at NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center. After some years of coordinating scientific experience, experiments sent aloft on Araby rockets from White Sands Missile Range, Fort Churchill, Canada, and Wallops Island, Virginia, he left engineering for graduate school to study literature at the University of Maryland and Oxford University. He then taught in English departments at Maryland and as an assistant professor at the U.S. Naval Academy before returning to the University of Maryland, this time as a science writer focusing on Chesapeake Bay research, and we talked about our common connections about that a little while ago. In the late 60s, Merrill and Neil Lehrman began Dryad, a poetry magazine that evolved into Dryad Press. Merrill was one of the four founders of the Writers' Center in Bethesda. He's been writing reviews and essays, has guest edited special issues of Poet Lore, the Changing Orders, Poetry from Israel, Shirim, a Jewish poetry magazine in Los Angeles, and Beltway Poetry Quarterly. He's currently the Poet Laureate of Tacoma Park, <laughs> and Mark the Music is his most recent book of poetry. Following the program, uh, Mark the Music will be available for sale and signing by the author. There'll be first sale available back there. Please note that today's event is being videotaped for subsequent broadcast on the library's webcast and other media. The audience is encouraged to ask questions following the reading, but note that your voice and image may be recorded and later broadcast as part of this event. By participating, you're consenting to the library's possible reproduction and transmission of your remarks. And without further ado, I'd like to introduce Merrill. Well, first of all, thank you, more than thank you. It's, um, you can imagine those of you who are here, and I see friends, it really knocks me out, I have to say, um, truly. Um, but to be in this space and to send poems aloft here is really a, a great honor to, and to be at the library, um, which I've been coming to since the 60s. Um, and um, so I want to thank the library. I want to say something. Uh, she's going to really knock me over the head, uh, but I'm going to say it anyway. Sandy Rogers is here. Sandy has been the art director of Dryer Press Books, and I've said on a number of occasions that I wouldn't be publishing books anymore if I wasn't working with Sandy all these years. Uh, she's not just a designer, but she's a designer and editor and, uh, and sidekick. <laughs> um, you know, so I was thinking about, uh, you, know, in, you know, if I was reading from a novel, um, I could do a summary and set a context and read a part of the novel and it would make a lot of sense. But um, in reading from a book of poetry, and especially a longer one, and especially one that has different kinds of word art in here, um, it's, uh, it's a little bit more difficult, I think, because you, know, you read one poem after another and the, you, know, you can get glassy-eyed after a while, uh, because each poem is like a in one sense, like a small you know, story or self-contained, and they're all 
you know, seemingly different. Um, and so um, when I was putting this book together, I was thinking about um, how do I contain these different, I would say, selves. We're all made up of more than you know, one self. Uh, you know, there's a part of me that was a comedian, another part of me that's a tragedian, so, uh, one who's a moralist, and one who's a skeptic, all these different aspects. Um, and I became much more aware of this as I was bringing together these poems that I'd written over a number of years, up until while we, you know, I was working with Sandy and putting this book together. Um, you know, pieces that I was writing it, you know, right then. And, and so the question was, how do I, do I just have this random collection or do I get, a, you know, is there some kind of structure that, um, at least for me, would contain these, um, you know, different selves? And um, at the same time, I was thinking about the kind of influences, the, the major influences in my life. And I'm not going to summarize them all, but they have to do certainly with family and upbringing, uh, you know, friends, poets and philosophers, and there are lots of poets and, re and philosophers that I refer to in here, just from quotes. Um, music, death, <laughs> um, uh, and a Jewish heritage. That's one reason I'm here, you know, the Hebrew division, um, because there are a number of poems that draw on that heritage of mine, as well as, uh, th in some cases, thematically uh, and, and as subjects. So, you know, in interrogating myself, how do I, you know, how do I bring all these different voices together? Can I bring them, can I bring them together, at least in a structure that would satisfy me, not that somebody else, you, if you were to sit down and actually look through this, if, if you would say, oh, this is, you know, this is a collection of <laughs> disparate pieces. Um, the structure for me was one that was a musical one. And so, in, in effect, it, there are three movements um, I've also thought of this, uh, thought of them uh, theatrically, but I think of them as three movements, and there are two intervals. And intervals were the kind of musical entertainments in between, you know, uh, an intermission. So there are two intervals here, um, and yeah, and I really had not connected up with the fact that I had this title. I mean, it, I realized that when, when I was doing this, Mark the Music, because I had carried around these, this quote from Shakespeare's Merchant of Venice. For, you know, for years. Originally, I was going to make this as a little chapbook, but it got larger and larger as I started trying to bring pieces in. And, um, you know, I'll just tell you the quote. It's really quite lovely. The man that hath no music in himself, nor is not moved by concord of sweet sounds, is fit for treasons, stratagems, and spoils. The motions of his spirit are dark as night, and his affections dark as Erebus, that's hell. Let no such man be trusted. Mark the music. So I hope um, you know, that, that there's music here, not, not in a sing-songy way, but in the, in the different parts that make the movements. So um, this is a long preface, but <laughs> it sets up what I, what I would like to do today. Um, is that Wally? No, uh, no I'm sorry. Um, I'll say why in a moment. Each, each movement, um, that I have, or each section, you know, often poets divide things into, you know, into sections. It's a way for us, you know, you can come to a rest. You don't see this one page after another, after another, after another. Uh, but each one of these um, sounds a kind of uh, tone for each of them. And, um, you know, some of them are related, uh, and I'll read some that are related to what I refer to as, you know, Jewish heritage or, or themes uh, that, that would be evident. Um, and so, um, I'll, yeah, I'll start off with one poem, and then I'll say something about this first section. So um, the first, this is a poem called Stories, and we're all into making stories, stories of our lives and stories. I mean, we, we live by stories. We have narratives. Um, so we can become very wedded to those narratives as well. So this is simply called Stories. The sun has hardly set, sent its light over the horizon and they are at your door clamoring, rousting you from a deep sleep. Open at your peril, a riot could break out, like men crazy for what you've got, and they'll take it if they want. Listen to them battering the air. I am your birth story, one cries. I am your abandonment story, cries another. I am your adoption story, shouts yet another, wringing its hands. I am the story of your youth, shouts one, 
and I the story of your dead parents, cries another. I am your war story of your dead, uh, I am your war story, the one you ran away from, another shouts, though it is muffled by the lust story that is out there raising hell. Up front before me, weeping, is the marriage story and the story of your children's departures. Next to them, the nostalgia story is swooning in despair. Beyond dirtying the street are the stories of regret and revenge. And near them, milling around, calling loudly, listen, listen, are the betrayal stories and the failure stories, each desperate for attention. Whispering in torment is the impotent story, and beside it, the dementia story. There, too, the stories of your cancer and the shrinking of the body. Over at the side, huddled in a corner, laughing hysterically, is the story of your former teeth and all those other stories I've neglected and that I never had time for. What a pandemonium of longing and rage. But beyond them all, at the far edge of the crowd, is another I can hardly make out at first. Silent, brooding, pushing its way ahead slowly, slowly. It is a story that every other has been whispering of for years, the one not spoken of aloud, that strikes fear, and now here suddenly stills all their wild clamoring. So, um, Peggy mentioned that, you know, something I wrote that I came here in, in the 60s as a, um, working for NASA and sending rockets up, in effect, with experiments on them. And there was a fellow who worked with us, worked for us, um, led to some publications which were very helpful at the time. And we haven't seen each other or, or, uh, or spoken to each other since 1965. Well, he's just been in touch with me this last two weeks. And, he, you know, he's wonderful guy. He reminded me how we used to speak about religion and philosophy all the time amidst the, you know, the experiments and rockets that we were involved with. But, and he said, I, um, he said that he had immersed himself in, in this book. And he liked a lot, you know, he liked a number of poems. I mean, friends say nice things and, and mean them too, and, and he genuinely did. But he also said he felt many of the earlier poems, and this is a quote, were very melancholy and dealt with a lot of darker death issues. So I said, well, you know, he's right, they do. But that is the starting point in this first movement of poems that deal with aging, you know, uh, dementia, death, but in different tones also, as you'll see. I'd like to read a couple of poems from that section, but, and also say that that's the starting point. <laughs> you, you know, often the book uh, comes to, you come to the end of someone my age, uh, you know, the end is, well, what's ahead of us? Nothing with a capital N. Well, this is the starting point. So this is, uh, you know, my experience, right? And, and those of us who reach a certain age. And um, so I give voice to them in, in very different ways. So there is a poem here, which um, I'm, I'm not going to read the whole thing because it's long. Although, and when a, when a poet, I've said this before, when a poet says, oh, I want to read you a long poem, <laughs> so I say, oh, God, what? Not, not that. <laughs> but... Um, so I'm not going to read the whole thing, although I probably could because it's, it's, it's a very bouncy and musical poem and has a lot of rhyming in it. Uh, and so, and I, but what I'll read is a few sections. And uh, these are, uh, the characters in this poem are colors, as you'll see. So there's Mrs. Green, there's Mrs. Orange, there's Mr. Brown and Mrs. Brown, there's you know, Mr. Gray, the super, you know, superintendent, um, and Madam Red. And Madame Red um, has a piece, but I also have a, an epigraph from Madame Red, who um, says, don't give me poems of unspeakable lives if you can't make the words bleed. Well, I don't know that I make the words bleed, but um, I'm gonna read just, um, I'll read a few pieces. Mrs. Green, um, let's see, Mrs. Brown. Old Mrs. Green, so this is how it starts out. Old Mrs. Green, grinning out her third floor window, cried sharply, don't speak to me of maybes or might have been. Speak to me of lovers running naked through the fire. My memory is alive with desire. Stewed, pitiful in her cups, they all agreed. Blue, that is, and Mrs. Orange living next door, and prim Miss Yellow on the second floor, and Mr. Brown, who merely nodded on the park bench that fall when the leaves were coloring yet again and the warm winds lifted them aloft while young mothers rolled strollers past him. 
Mr. Brown, invisible now, once had ladies in his thrall, or so he thought. All of you are living lies, screamed old Mrs. Green from her third floor window up there to no one anywhere. Poor old fracture down for the count, they nodded, drinking tea and eating oatmeal cookies passed out by Mr. Gray, the super, that last afternoon of old Mrs. Green on our block. I didn't say the title. The title of this is uh, Our Block, a play in one act. And so each one of these characters, in a sense, comes, you know, comes to the fore. Um, so this is Mrs. Brown. There is a Mr. Brown, but this is Mrs. Brown. Mrs. Mrs. Brown's gone down underground dead. They all agreed once more at Mrs. B's door. Mrs. Orange wanted to cry, and though she tried the best she could do, it was a longer sigh. Miss Yellow could not speak. Her heart, she said, was much too weak. I'll have no part in this, said Madame Red from her bed on the second floor. Don't mourn for me, Mrs. Brown once said when she was feeling grim, and once again when she was feeling light and free. When you're dead, you're dead. Life's just a show. Stagehand or star, over and over again, it's the same old play. Mr. Brown sat in the park until dark that day and fed breadcrumbs to the birds. I'm all words, he muttered to himself, words and more words. So the theme itself is, is you know, a bit dark, right? Uh, but it's, um, I hope it's, it has a certain kind of lift because of the rhythms you know, and the rhymes. Um, maybe I'll just read Madame Red. She's one of my favorites. <laughs> um, well, you wonder where these come from. They just somehow appear. <laughs> uh, Madame Red. Madame Red receives visitors in her bedroom and special visitants in her bed. I can view the days ahead, she says, and what the future holds for you and you and you, for Blue and poor Miss Yellow and Mrs. O on the floor below. I was once with Mr. O. It was no good, nor Mr. Brown soft as he was in both heads. And Blue was all beery talk, but that's been long ago and gone. We're all done, friends, all done. That's the future that I see, and what I see is what I see. And so there are the, these stanzas are all interconnected because one refers to something that we, we hear. In terms of that kind of, you know, ha having a rhythm or a movement of a poem that is in a kind of counterpoint to the theme, uh, I never thought of this as terrifying, but um, a friend in Vermont who, um, had read the book, you know, wrote me and she said, you know, this poem, The Lady in Her Shadow, is really a terrifying poem. Well, this is a poem that I, I have read and worked with young students with. Not because, not that they necessarily understood it, but they got caught up in the, in the rhythm. Uh, for several years afterward, my, gr my oldest granddaughter, uh, I pick her up and she says, say, you know, say that poem again. She had, remem you know, she had remembered some of the lines. So it's called The Lady and Her Shadow. The lady had thin yellow hair. She walked with a limp and could hardly bear the sun, and so hid from the man with balloons who had a wide, toothy, masculine grin, and, were truth known, was one of the demons of air. A fair complexion he, a bit opaque, biceps like brick, an engineer counting his data by twos and by threes, divided by the square root of whatever agrees. And this may sound silly to you, but it wasn't at all to the lady with thin yellow hair who died of exposure, not from the sun, but the leer of the man with the wide toothy grin and biceps like brick who walked on the beach with balloons in the air and grinned at the lady with yellowy hair who knew not enough to get up and scoot away quick like a fish out of there. I don't have long enough breath to get it all in one, one line. And so I, I've used this little poem with, with, with kids and they laugh, you know, and, and it's, it's the rhythm they're caught up in. And, um, and I think that's good enough. <laughs> um, the last poem in this section, in this movement, is called Farewell. And, um, and um, it's a, a, po a quatrain poem, if you remember from school. You know, it has a little rhyme scheme to it. There are a few poems here that rhyme, actually. Um, and this is one of them. And it's called Farewell. And it's a little bit more elusive. <laughs> In these faces, it is always farewell. You may see yourself here or not. Remember, this has come after these other poems, like, with, you know, um, it's not that everything is intentional here, but you discover when you're putting something together, you, you somehow it's like fitting pieces 
and I discovered that I liked the way some of these pieces move from one to the other. So in these faces, it is always farewell. You may see yourself here or not. You may walk a straight line to hell and arrive through the front door or knock without thinking at the back. You may be schooled in caution like a spy and count every step and still backtrack into the arms of the enemy. You may crawl on your hands, on your knees for a hundred years and engrave a yellow star on your breast. You may try and cover your fears and pretend you have come to a rest. Dear friends, we are traveling this way alone. Finally, there are no lies. Minute by minute, day by day, each life is a blessing, each blessing a disguise. So that brings us to the end of this section and it launches into this first interlude. And there, I mentioned that there are two interludes. And uh, in keeping, for me, with the way that I started to see the theme of the, the structure of this book, this first interlude brings together some poems that are rather you know, you know, dark, uh, it, uh, having to do with executions, having to do with um, it's something called negotiation that begins, this is mine, and this, and this right here, you can have that, and that, and that, but I want this, and this, and this right here. I said you can have that, and that, and that. It's that kind of, you know, you can look at it in different kinds of confrontations, political confrontations, or personal ones. Um, in here are um, a couple of poems that uh, I translated with Moshe Dor, wonderful Israeli poet, and we were translating together uh, a poet by the name of Eitan Eitan, who was a farmer, a very successful farmer, but he had also been an Israeli ranger, and he had been in a number of wars, and he knew war. And um, I'm not going to read you this whole poem, just to give you a flavor of it, uh, because uh, we, I included about four poems. Um, we, we did a special issue of a magazine that I guest edited uh, along with Moshe Shireen, which is out in California, and just of Eitan Eitan's poems. Um, so this is called Children, and the Hebrew for children, and I've included that as Yeladim. Yelad is a child, Yeladim is children. And I'm just going to read the first few stanzas. I was happy to say one of the things, um, my first choice was trying to get it into the nation, but it was too much or too long or whatever, or the poetry editor didn't care for it. But, the mag but I wanted to see it in the, if it was going to be published in a magazine that um, was not just simply a poetry magazine, that it had, at least had the, ideally a larger readership. And um, there's a, a, a journal, a um, progressive Jewish journal, Tikkun, which some of you may know. And it, and it was surprising that they published this because it was so long, they don't usually do that. So I'm just going to read a few, just uh, a, a few stanzas. And it's rather tough, and, and this is it, uh, taking the, the Hebrew of Eitan, Eitan. Children, Yeladim, you who will die in the next war, burnt up in tanks or ripped by splintered shells, shocked, your hands and your limbs torn from you, be not afraid. Be not afraid of its arrival because you will die in the next war, suddenly or slowly or with no warning or during a desperate fight. Be not afraid now and fear not its arrival because death will take you in war and without war at its own choosing. Children, Yeladim you are and you will die in the next war following a deafening Fuhrer because there is no war without death and no war without Fuhrer and no life without death at its own choosing. Rush not to swallow the poison awaiting you, and rush not to love or to hate. Hold no hope for rescue or that war will not come, because it will, and battle awaits you. Torn flesh, burnt bodies, and spilled blood, and gray shriveled bones, and hovering ghosts. Well, on the one hand, we look to art to comfort, but we also look to art to disturb us out of our comforts or our pieties. And that's one of the things that Eitan does in, in this poem, which by the time it gets to the end, it's a kind of transcendent poem. Um, so I want to read the last poem in this section, which is also by Eitan. And I must say, I, I love working with Moshe in translating these. And I went word by word. I literally almost wore out one Hebrew dictionary. Um, so this is called The Wind Grinds, and you'll see it the way it, this leads to this next section because of the last couple of lines of this poem, um, which look ahead. Um, 
but not in any, I don't think, any sentimental way. The wind grinds bones to dust in the courtyard of death, grinds clouds, vehicles in a low, continuous burning, grinds soldiers, grinds cannons and guns, grinds buildings, grinds animals, grinds you and me. Listen, leave your explosives, your vehicles, your soldiers, leave your animals, your wars, your people, they all left you long ago. You have the wind with you, you have the burning light, the land and the dew with you, you have the whole pulverized earth with you. Set your face towards begetting, set your face once more towards rising. And there are those biblical echoes in there. I mean, I don't think any Hebrew poet, even if he or she wanted to, could get away from biblical implications because the language is so part of it, even though it's modern Hebrew. Um, so, I'm like, okay. I'm rushing on. <laughs> the second, this second movement, and there are poems here that, um, that, what should I say, they have a wryness about them, a questioning about them, um, and, I, and there are some um, poems that come out of the, you know, the Bible. I think I want to read one of them. Uh, and um, you know, when I said this Jew, you know, Jewish heritage, one, what I have brought from my Jewish heritage is, that, is one that you question. You question everything. You question, you know, nothing is not, not subject to interrogation, so to speak. Um, so this one, this poem, now, I, I'm going to be repeating the first, there, it's in two parts, and the two parts are the same, except for one line, and, uh, and it's called Limits, and, um, and it goes like this. Here says God, the author of us all, you are my invention. What can I say, he says, I too am limited in what I can create. Once I had an idea and worked like a poet driven mad by dreams, delighted like every god before me. With such powers, I imagined a brave new world and took it on with gusto. What hubris. After all, how much can I do? I also get writer's block. I too get depressed. I too have limits and am condemned to repeat myself. Meanwhile, you bother me so with your petty woes. What about me? I too could use compassion. Some pity on your part wouldn't hurt. For God's sakes, what would you be without me, without even my dullest idea? Enough already. I have given you the outline, you make the plot. Go, Gollum, travel as you will. I wash my hands of you. You are no longer my business. P.S., you can keep in touch. <laughs> well, I won't read the second part, but just to let you know, the second part is the same, except it doesn't have that line, keep in touch. And that's for the reader to, that ideal reader, um, to decide <laughs> or take it however he or she will. Um, most of you, I'm sure, know, uh, you know the, the quintessential story, in, um, or one of the quintessential stories in the Bible is uh, the binding of Isaac, or as it's called in Hebrew, the Akedah, in which God commands Abraham to sacrifice his son, his only son, of course he has two sons. Uh, he has a son by Hagar, who is Ishmael, um, and his son Isaac, who Sarah gives birth to in her 80th year. There have been, thousands, literally thousands of commentaries, poems, commentaries about Abraham's willing, not even, no questioning. And it's not that Abraham doesn't question their parts in the Bible, like in, uh, um, when Abraham bargains with God, uh, you know, as forgiven God in the Bible. But he doesn't, he just does his duty, and then at the last moment, God reprieves him. Um, well, many of us, you're obsessed by this story. And there's a long poem in here, I'm not gonna read that because I think it's more of a meditative poem. Because and essentially what I've done is I've taken you know, one of the biblical translations, for the most part I've made a few adjustments, but it's, um, but it's this, it's, and then have commentaries about each one of those passages in there. But the poem that I wanna to read to you, you know, uh, Abraham goes off, he takes Isaac and um, he doesn't tell Sarah, as far as we know. I mean, well, that's all we're given. And I was thinking of Sarah. I was thinking of the mother. And so this is a poem in Sarah's voice, which may be a little bit hubris taking on a woman's voice, but here it is. 
So this is her, her voice. I knew, and there was nothing I could do. In matters of the one God, I was no one. No more to him than a mere presence, nothing. The grief I felt welling up like a storm, I held back as though an ache I had no right to possess. Was I not the mother? Did I not suffer the birth? With him, God was no mystery. Elohim, he said, Yahweh El Shaddai, and a hundred other names. That simple belief was more than I can contend with. I lacked power, let alone will. My anger was like sand thrown against the desert winds. I prayed to the miraculous one as if I believed there was purpose. As if I believed uh, the voice he said he knew, like love in his heart. Fool, I cried, you are the victim of a mad heart. You are possessed by a demon that gives nothingness a name and then bows in submission. He, in his single-mindedness, could no longer hear, but rose before dawn and took the son of my aged body, who himself obeyed in ignorant trust and journeyed for days with a solemnity I would spit on. When they returned, I knew reasons would be given, explanations. He, my husband, could raise words out of a sandstorm as if that storm were guided not by the former gods of our home, but a viewless God who spoke in syllables of air. Um, the biblical writers left Sarah's voice out of there. She just, you know, uh, there have been many, again, many commentaries, many, not just poems, but you know, rabbinic commentaries on all of this. Um, so, uh, I, I'd like to read a couple of other poems from this section, um, and one that uh, many of us um, you might like, <laughs> uh, maybe. I was, and there's an epigraph, and I love this epigraph because those of you know William James, a man I have, you know, many of us have great admiration for. He was the brother of Henry James. He was a psychologist, and he was such a humane man. And I came across this quote from William James. Even the happiest men, the one most envied by the world in nine cases out of 10, his inmost consciousness is of failure. I think William James can feel failure. No. Anyway. Uh, so this poem is called Failure. And failure, as you'll see, becomes a muse. And um, so it goes like this. The rosy dawn sleeps underneath your, I'm sorry. The rosy dawn slips underneath your sleep and wakens you to failure sitting on your bed. She whispers seductively even before you've relieved your bladder or brushed your teeth or walked out the door for the paper. She crawls through your body like a lover, her hands all over you. She cannot get enough, she says. She believes in you. You don't need to, she says, uh, speaking in a language you don't understand. You don't need to, she says, leaning up against you at work or staring back from the mirror. It's the feeling that counts. I am with you on your rising up and your lying down. I am your companion. The wind whistling through your sails, she croons. The rudder in your hand. The sea in which you navigate. Think of me, she says, as your sister separated from you at birth. As your dark queen, your passionate other. Failure welcomes you into her lavish rooms or sits on a stoop in Baltimore, her arm around your shoulder or on a subway rattling through Brooklyn or in Arroyo in Mexico, or somewhere in the desert where the heat has riven your body with drought. She is the soul of generosity. Ask nothing of her, and she will give all, she will give all that she has. <laughs> Ask for everything, and she'll give that as well. I call out the best in you, she sighs, like a lover. Come to me now. If you could only love me the way I love you, we might even make poetry. <laughs> so. Somehow it feels to me, this and, and several other poems, that if I, um, I grew up hearing Yiddish, as I write in the preface, but I never really learned the language. Uh, you, you know, I grew up, my cousin Howard and Linda are here, and we grew up in a family that was really an immigrant family. And the idea was that they were to become so thoroughly American that everything was left behind. They didn't even talk about the childhood. And Yiddish was the language they spoke, the secret language. So we always picked up pieces, but never really learned the language. Um, but I felt if I could write, if I really knew Yiddish, some of these would have been written in Yiddish. At least I'd like to think so. Uh, so, for example, this poem, uh, which has a Yiddish translation beside it. I, I love the way it looks graphically, too. 
And it's got a provocative title, but I have to read right off the, uh, you know, the epigraph. It's called Intercourse. And the epigraph is, Isaac Luria did not differentiate. He was a you know, Kabbalistic um, rabbi and Safed in, in, um, in Israel in the 17th century, 16th to 17th. Isaac Luria, writes Gershom Sholem, did not differentiate between organic and inorganic life, but insisted that souls were present everywhere and that intercourse with them was possible. So this is a poem that is, as you'll hear, it's just, it repeats, so thank you, thank you. Thank you, say the shoes, you, and this is the organic and the inorganic. Thank you, say the shoes you have placed under the bed, and thank you, says the quilt, for the warmth of your skin. Thank you, says the window, for lifting my sash, and thank you, says the broom, for the grip of your hands. Thank you, says the shirt, for buttoning my sleeves, and thank you, says the pond, for throwing me stones. Thank you, says the bulb, for my planting in earth, and thank you, says the pen, for writing these lines. Thank you, says the book, for turning my page, and thank you, says the mirror, for your face each day. And thank you, says Delmore, for remembering my poems. Thank you, says the Torah, for chanting the Shema. And thank you, says my father, for the gift of your life, and my mother says likewise from the grave in my heart. And thank you, I reply, in my exit from here. Wherever I travel, you go with me there. And that leads to these poems that um, are much simpler in this last, in, in this last section. But I, I read this, the last poem of this section, which um, I mentioned Moshe Dor, who is um, very sick right now, he's in Israel. And he translated into Hebrew, and so that sits side by side. There's this invisible spine that goes down between the two. Um, the Hebrew goes in one direction, the English goes in the other direction. So it's called take hold. If there is nothing before you, take hold of it. You may be fortunate or not, place it deep in your pocket regardless, it is a possession as no other. When you are to leave and have made all your arrangements, when you are ordered to declare all your possessions, reach into the dark pocket. This is no symbol, traveler, no parable. Nothing is as whole as the space in the air you pass through, and it is yours if you will take hold of it. So um, I'm not going to read. There's a second interlude, and it's made up of some funny poems. And uh, I say funny, you know, some surrealistic poems, some word art. Um, uh, the Gollum is, uh, I assume everybody knows you know, the Gollum. The Gollum is probably the most, um, you know, from Jewish folklore, probably the most used uh, story. I mean, there are scores and scores and scores of books, children's books you know, and other books. And before that poem limits, uh, we have God saying, go Gollum. You know, Gollum a Gollum is made out of clay. And uh, in, the, in the legendary story, um, you know, Rabbi Lowy from uh, Budapest, uh, not Budapest, from Ch uh, Prague, walks around the, you know, the, the human figure of clay, does these Kabbalistic incantations, there are variations of this, and brings the golem to life. And so I think I've thought, in a way, we are golems, you know, we're God's golem. But there's also a golem here. Um, and so again, this was because Sandy made it possible for me to do this. Uh, this is just a figure, this is a golem, just made up of the word golem. It's all words. Uh, okay. So I, I have time for a couple of other poems. Um, so, um, so these are, I'll just say in this section, are poems which take life as it is. Um, you know, not railing against the way things are, but they're in one sense, pleasures that there are, pleasures of being, pleasures of making, uh, pleasures of observing. Um, so for example, there's a poem here called Butterflies by Brookside. How many of you have been to Brookside Gardens? You know, right? Well, this is just a poem made up of the names of butterflies that I took from, and then I put the scientific names, almost no commentary, just the kind of, a, you know, here you have American Painted Lady, Cabbage White, um, comma, great spangled fritillary, and then we have the scientific names, which are a little, you know, the, we need them to classify, but it's, they're not so exciting. Um, 
It's not making any commentaries about science, which I love. But, um, okay, so this is a poem called Re uh, Resemblances, and um, I think it speaks for itself. And here on the left hand is what he is, and there on the right is what he would be. The left, left hand often loses its way, Fault is where it would step, is continually in debt, misses deadlines, apologizes too much, lies like an alcoholic, worries the dot over every eye, must squint to see clearly, wakes to a despair so deep down, light finally gives up and goes home. The right, on the other hand, is impatient with such indirection, knows the value of money, pays its bills on time, owes nothing to the government, never gets fines, is as reliable as death, has a clean house, new furniture, gives charity each day, dresses well, and has plaques on its wall for community service. The left hand sometimes fights with the right, not in street brawls, but as if over a word in the Midrash, that's the commentary of the Talmud, as over a word in Midrash, or like a husband and wife of long years, or a shopkeeper and customer over the price of damaged goods, this is all right, I say for us out here. It is good theater and gives us something to gossip about or make art from. Meanwhile, the left hand sleeps with the peace of mountains and the right with the worry of storms. Who can explain life's inexplicable ways? Every so often, calm descends between mountain and storm. And it is then you invite yourself in, a visitor carrying candles and cakes, on such days, the right hand takes hold of the left and both sit over steaming hot glass of tea, dropping sugar cubes in. And like ancient antagonists who have grown old together, they sip at the tart bitter sweetness until dark. So these are these poems that are, you know, sweet, literally. And I, again, I hope not uh, sentimental, but, um, but sweet. So I'll read um, a couple of other poems. Um, one, which I think will be fun. <laughs> I'm bringing my wife Anne here. She knows which one this would be. This is, <laughs> this is called A Sweet, and it has this um, Jewish folklore element in it too, as you see. My wife says, this is a fictional wife, of course. <laughs> my wife says, you should take better care of your feet. Look at those poor dogs, hammer toes, bunions, corns, neuromas, ugh. What neglect they have suffered. Think of the abuse they have carried you through, running up and down courts, climbing mountain after mountain of despair, then descending deeply into the valley after valley of the same. The least you could do is give them the, the care they so richly deserve. Warm baths to begin with, unguents, soothing creams, and a loving woman, honey on her tongue, to lay next to. Two. It's in three parts. They were written at different times, but then they all seem to go together in some way. I'm sorry, I'd like to help, but I'm not going to keep your feet warm. I'll knit you a pair of socks. <laughs> okay, so the, the third part is, um, what I know of Rabbi Weiss of Bilka, though it would not fill a shot glass, is this. To study Talmud into the night, he'd stick his feet in ice water and keep them there, it was said, to ward off sleep from spreading through his body. I have it on no authority, of course, but I would like to think it was his way to not forget his body while his soul set forth into the thick wilderness of God's law. Oh, Rabbi Weiss of Bilka, not even a smudge in my memory, not a pinprick in the history of the dead. I can imagine you at Matisse's table, the light holding you in place, dining on the sweet breath of life. Old men wringing from each hour the honey that flows like fire in the blood. Rabbi Weiss of Bilka, for God's sakes, who knows how you might have forsaken your wife for study, or for that matter, how you came to her in dark passion, your appetite for wisdom like Solomon's, so full you met each other with gratitude and love. O oh, Rabbi Weiss of Bilka, I drink to the memory of your feet. May they live in incandescence to light even the darkest way. I think they do. Okay, so this is... Um, Actually, I'm going to read two, the two last poems of the book. The first one is Rejoice. Um, what has the world to do with you, or you, or me? What can time that unassailable abstraction care, or the moon, the sun, the stars visible and invisible, 
or the ocean rolling in at your door, or the great oak outside that shades your thoughts, or the finches feeding on seeds you have set out, or the mountain implacable behind you, or memories that have given up their hold, your mother in the far horizon, your father and all who have held you and spoken love to you from the beginning. Or say it, this life which holds neither grief nor happiness in your coming or in your going, or the earth that will cover you, or the darkness that will gather your dust to itself, or the winds that may lift and scatter you anywhere. The sea, the sea's edge, the mountains, the forest, the earth once more. Rejoice, rejoice. So there's a bit of a moralistic part of me too. Um, and this is the last poem, and it's, it's called Beginnings and Ends, and um, and has to do, I guess, with what all of this is made out of, is words, and words is what we have. And on the one hand, they're inadequate, and it's the one thing that we have. It's the great possession. So here is the word that divides the dark, and here is the word that is filled with light. Here is the word that severs the sea and separates sky and uncovers the earth. Here is the word that revels in breath, and here is the word that cleaves your soul. And here is the word for singing your love, and here is another for singing your grief. Here are the words that will blind your eyes, that will freeze your tongue, that will strike you deaf. And here is the word to open the dark, and here is another to empty the light, and here is the last to carry you home. So, thank you. I don't know if there are any questions that people are happy to. That was wonderful. Thank, Thank you so Thank you. much. Any questions or <laughs> comments? We'd be happy to hear from you. I didn't even plant them. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, you may have to repeat the question, Meryl, uh, for the webcast. I'll just say this is Stephanie Ney, and Stephanie is an artist, and we did a collaboration together in Tacoma Park. Um, Ann Becker, who had been the Poet Laureate in Tacoma Park, arranged, brought artists together and poets, and we, all, we found each other, and it was really a lovely exp experiment, and a book came out of it too, in which the poet responded to a, a work, you know, work uh, of that artist, and then the artist uh, responded to a poem, so there were four pieces for each collaboration. So I have a question now. Okay, Frederica. I don't expect you to speak for all poets, but I want <laughs> you to tell me why is it that poets fear that they may be interpreted as sentimental? Oh, okay. Did everybody get the question? The question. Yeah, um, Frederica. Mosier, who was, can I say, director of Merrill Instant Grant, where I worked for many years, um, asked, why do poets fear being sentimental? Well, because you want your words to, I don't know if I can answer this, but I think you want your words to matter, that, you, that they earn the feeling or the emotion or what it is you're saying, and that they're not, they're not relying on pieties um, that, um, that you're really discovering, you know, you, for yourself at any rate, discovering something. I won't say new in the world, but something new for yourself. And so it seems authentic rather than repeating that which we know and it's, no, it doesn't even make any difference anymore. You know, um, at least I think, I think that's the reason. Or one reason. Yeah. Your interest in the visual arts is and the book expresses that to an extent. I've looked through it any number of times. And like, I mean, that when you said about that invisible spine between translation and the, the Hebrew translation and the, and, the, and the English like that, you know, but there's other examples like the Gaul is an example in there too, I mean, obviously that impacts you in your, in your writing and what have you. I don't know if the visual arts impact you or if you feel like you want to enter into the visual arts to extend that in that way or something. You know? I know there's more to that idea of the translation. Those translations almost look symmetric on the page. 
Yeah. Well, uh, Aaron, you, you hear where's Aaron, who, who writes, writes in Yiddish, and, um, and you can write in Yiddish going from left to right, or from right to left, and I remember Aaron asked me if, how come I was writing, for, you know, having the Yiddish from right to left instead of the other way, and it had to do visually. You know, I, I love the way, um, you know, graphically they looked, and you can do it either way, uh, at least I think. <laughs> Maybe not modern Yiddish poets or contemporary Yiddish poets, um, but uh, yeah, there's something about you know the graphic, and there are some other graphic things in here. There's a poem in here called Montaigne and Me, and they alternate quotations from a poem of mine and by Montaigne. And my friend Henry Allen had done a, a portrait of me, a black and white portrait. And I thought, oh, I I like that. It's rather haunted looking. I don't, never saw myself that way, but um, except at certain times. <laughs> but uh, I thought, okay, we'll put a portrait of Montaigne in one corner and me in the other corner. So that's there. And so it's, I, I think I would, I, I think what I like, not I think, what I like is bringing as much in and I would like to do more, you know, I'd like to do that. You know, not to exclude. And so it means not excluding those aspects of oneself that don't seem poetic, for example, you know. You, you can get, you can develop a voice, which is your voice, and, um, but I, you know, I'm kind well, of. Being a, uh, just thinking also, just you think being a maker of books as well, or a publisher of books as well, probably enters in, in that, and that also is an aspect of your, so in terms of like that being like sort of a, a self-portrait, part of the thing, sort of a self-portrait, that all enters into the oh. book. No, Sandy can tell you, we went back and forth on the typography, the font, and, uh, and all of that. So yeah, the, gra you know, the graphic really, um, and, it, and it's in the books that I published in Dryad with Sandy and uh, Susan Foster before, that, you know, before Sandy. Yeah, I love that, as it is in Lily Herman's new chapbook that we just published. <laughs> Came yesterday. Uh, yeah. One okay. last question. Mm -hmm. You mentioned that you know, the theme of music in your poetry and the title, and I was looking up, and I'm sure you planned this. <laughs> you have Liszt and Bach and Mozart, and Hyam and But I, ha I have to say, you know, um, for, you know, a friend Zona Hostetler is here, and for the last six or seven years, or eight years, I've been listening to a lot of n new music. Mm -hmm. um, well, it's not so new, but we call it you know, new, old, new, older music. Um, and a lot of the, um, not just the atonality, but taking in so much. I mean, you, th you, know, you can think of John Cage, but that's, you know, even he's now a couple of generations, genera at least a generation ago. Uh, so I'd like to use more of that. Anyway, okay. All right, thank you once again, and uh, if you would like to speak to Merrill and offer him comments or ask him questions, he'll stick around, and there are books available for sale in the back. Thank you very much for coming today. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.